On this program, we have spoken a lot about the East Grand Post School District and how the insular Orthodox Jewish community is often at odds with Rockland County and residents who are not a part of that community. Now, a bit further north in Orange County, the Hasidic village of Curious Joel has had more than its share of controversy. A new book details just how this village is like no other in the entire United States and has fought to keep it that way, going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It is called The Curious Case of Curious Joel, and I spoke with the author, Louis Grumet. So much I want to get into, but before we get into the First Amendment, the New York roots here, um, and, and moreover, how this case wound its way all the way up to the Supreme Court and where we find ourselves today, for folks who may have heard the name but can't place it on the map, Give a little bit of a background where Curious Joel is, and if they walked into the town, how maybe they think they would have been transported to some place not of America and of a different time. Curious Joel is a little village in uh, Orange County, New York, which is by Newburgh. It's in the Mid-Hudson. It's right by 17, <coughs> which is the road that goes into the Catskills. And it's on land that at one stage was meant to be industrial land for the fourth jet port in New York. And when that land became available, some Canadians came down and bought it and then immediately flipped it uh, to these people. Uh, the people themselves are a much more interesting story. They are the Satmar Hasidim. They're from the town of St. Mary's in Hungary. Uh, they left Hungary. Uh, part of the Holocaust and as part of the terrible things that happened uh, to them uh, over in that area and they came to Brooklyn. Uh, they came under the leadership of a widely respected rabbi, Joel Teitelbaum, and the, the title village of, of Curious Joel is the village of Joel, named after Rabbi Teitelbaum. Rabbi Teitelbaum brought them to Brooklyn. There was a huge community of Satmar uh, in the Williamsburg area of Brooklyn. And the rabbi believed very strongly that they should not become Americanized. He felt very, very deeply that they had to go back to their roots. They had to recreate a shtetl, <coughs> very much like they had in Eastern Europe. He believed in separatism. He believed in, in total isolation. He believed in building a wall around his people. And so they don't read newspapers, they don't watch television, they don't play baseball, they don't see movies, they don't dress uh, the way they, they do, there was a particular type of dress. And, and by the way, they're the one Hasidic group that does not recognize Israel. Uh, they believe that if God wants Israel to come along, God will do that. They don't need the United Nations to interfere. So you've got this city, and there's other cities like mm -hmm. it, but for this conversation, we're going to focus on Curious Joel. 30 some odd mm -hmm. miles from the city, and people may remember a blurb uh, eight, ten years ago where a woman was wearing a dress, an observant woman, that wasn't down to her ankle and people were throwing rocks at her. And there was other stories where people asked to leave because they weren't observant. And then the natural question said, wait a minute, this is New York, this is the United States of America, we have basic freedoms in this country, you can dress the way you want, um, you can observe in a church or house of worship you want or not, um, and you can converse with whoever you like, but very clearly if people drive through the town, it's tacitly and very overtly made, you're not welcome here if you're not one of us, and if you don't dress and do the things like one of us, there will be problems. And there's a litany of examples, Lou, that I'm sure you can cite here, that this has been made clear to everybody that um, comes into the community, they want it this way and they're going to enforce it this way. They only enforce their own laws. Uh, they are not interested in being part of New York's laws. Uh, they may not have that choice, but they are politically extraordinarily adept. Uh, one of the reasons they're so adept is because they vote. They tend to vote over 90% of their population, their registered you know, population, and they vote exactly the way the Rebbe tells them. Uh, district attorneys will be decided by their votes. Um, sometimes statewide officials will be decided, let alone local community officials. Well, let me tell you why they're so important. Because they're in two locales. In Orange County, they tend to be the swing vote. Uh, you may only have eight or 9,000 votes, but eight or 9,000 votes that vote as one block can throw an election. Uh, you may remember that the congressional seats tends to swing back and forth, yep. usually by around 4,000 votes. 
and the Satmar announced their support usually the week before the election for whoever wins, and they deliver 8,000 votes for that person. But that's not really the source of their power. The source of their power is in Williamsburg, where they still have an enormous community. They can deliver 50,000 votes in Williamsburg. Now, 50,000 votes is on the margins, and they're very good at voting on the margins. They understand when they are the margin. And Kings County, Brooklyn, is the largest voting uh, county in the United States. And consequently, if they can throw Brooklyn in one direction, they can throw a statewide election in one direction. Hmm. And that's how they are so powerful. So now let's pivot um, to the genesis of a, of a case that all the, went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, so they settled um, in Curious Jaw. Um, and one of the things that comes up is that you have some children with special needs. And quickly it was realized that going through the public arena for this, um, maybe they weren't welcomed as much as they had hoped, um, but certainly there was a lot of commingling with people in the public sphere that they weren't comfortable with. Give the genesis why they decided that going through and being part of a broader community was clearly not going to work for them and how they went about figuring out an sure. alternative. Well, first of all, let me back you up. The village itself isn't just like any other village. Matter of fact, it's the only village like it in the United States. It's a theocracy. Mm -hmm. It is run by the Rebbe. He selects who the you know, elected officials are. And the way they became a village is that they moved to the town of Monroe and they wanted to build uh, a particular type of housing, which was uh, multifamily housing for very large families. They have a lot of kids. And the, uh, the buildings they wanted to build were violating the zoning and building laws of the town of Monroe. And they couldn't build them. And so they discovered a loophole in the village law that says if you have 600 or more people in a contiguous unit, you can form your own village by petition and nobody can stop you. Nobody lives in the village of Curious Joel except Satmar. They are the village. The village is them. And they control their own rules. And they had their own building codes and their own zoning, and so they built. They also are very inbred, and I, I use that word neutrally mm -hmm. because it's a small community yep. and, and they have very strong beliefs as to who you're allowed to marry. And therefore, they have a problem with recessive genes. They acknowledge that. And, uh, and they have a fairly high proportion of disabled children. Disabled children are very expensive, whereas the average child, the seven or 8,000 uh, children, or however many they have today, uh, who are not disabled, go to yeshivas, to private yeshivas, and they take care of that, and that's that. There are no public schools, so to speak. But they couldn't afford to do this with these extremely expensive disabled children. I understand that. I used to run the statewide handicapped children program. Those children could have and should have been placed. Yep. And they finally decided well, that they would place them in the Monroe Woodbury School District. Monroe Woodbury is a good suburban school district. It has a wonderful handicapped children program. And that should have worked. But there were some teachers in Monroe Woodbury who were, to say the least, a little insensitive. And so they demanded their own schools. They weren't going to get their own schools. Uh, they had problems with women driving the boys in the buses. There were a series of problems. They wanted everything done their way. Finally, at a big meeting that was held in the board president's home, Roberta Murphy's home, uh, with all the politicians from the area, and I do mean all of the politicians in the area, their assemblyman, a very ambitious young man named George Pataki, said, look, why don't you just form your own school district? I'll show you how to do it. Now, it's not as easy as George said, but George was a Republican who couldn't get a bill through the assembly unless, of course, he had somebody from Brooklyn mm -hmm. co-sponsor it. Yep. And so he goes to the Brooklyn people and he says, look, this will be very popular down there. I need this bill. And they put this bill through. Mel Miller, who was the speaker of the assembly and very powerful at that moment, was violently opposed to this bill. He said it's unconstitutional. It can't go forward. Nobody took it seriously until the last night of the legislative session when it went through the assembly, 150 to 1. By the way, Miller voted for it. Up next, the legal battle that has been going on for so long and was so far-reaching, even Mario Cuomo got involved when he was governor. 